Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today we're going to talk about whether or not the coronavirus is something you need to worry about. Let's get to it. So the purpose of this video is to help alleviate fears that people are having over the coronavirus. For every fear I alleviate though, I'm probably going to replace it with a concern. But I think overall, people are going to walk away from this video feeling a little bit better about the situation. Now, this is going to be a fairly comprehensive and lengthy video. So if you got stuff to do, just let this play in the background. Get back to work. Definitely going to want to stick with me on this video because there's a lot of things I'm going to be talking about, which you're probably not going to hear anywhere else. And at the end of this video, I'm going to tell you what my SHTF threshold is with this. That is, when do I really start taking this seriously? I will say that let this just be a drop in the bucket of all of the information that you take in about this topic. I'm in a position of influence here on YouTube and that's something I take seriously because I know that there's some people who base the decisions that they make when it comes to these things on what I say. Now, I don't think that's a good idea for anybody. I think you should be drawing from multiple sources, but I'm gonna do my best to paint as accurate a picture of the problem as I can. And the closer you get to the problem, the more you learn about what's going on, and I'm talking about doing a serious deep dive, uh, the less it starts to look like a problem, but there still is a lot of potential for this thing to potentially get out of control. And the last thing I wanna do is be like the notorious blogger on the movie Contagion, if you haven't seen that movie yet. Uh, I think it's probably one of the most realistic depictions of what something like this might look like and how it would play out. I also have to clarify a mistake I made in my last video on pandemic preparedness. I indicated that the Spanish flu only took the lives of 2.5% of its victims. The real statistic, which is commonly misinterpreted, even by researchers in the field, is that it's greater than 2.5%. So if you recall, there was several waves to the Spanish flu, and the mortality rates varied throughout those three waves and overall it was greater than 2.5 but a lot of people uh, a lot of researchers indicate that the actual mortality rate was more around 7.5 to 15 percent so that's positive news because so far this virus has a very low uh, mortality rate at around 2.5 percent but we're going to talk about why that might not be the whole story here also so the first thing I should mention is that pandemic supplies are selling out worldwide at a very rapid rate and the prices of these items is going up. China cannot keep up with the demand of its population. I've been getting requests for very large volumes of supplies and unfortunately I can't meet that demand. Now, I never want to be on the end of a transaction as a vendor of preparedness supplies where people are doing things out of fear and perhaps uh, are misinformed about what's going on. So I hope this video is going to help alleviate some of those fears because the last thing I want people to do is make life-changing financial decisions as a result of something that I say. There's a lot of people who are charging exorbitant prices for these products and I've had requests for large orders and the idea is that people are flipping it for a much higher price than they buy it off of me for and so I've suspended uh, large orders now it's just going to be you know when I do actually get resupplied here it's going to be uh, one per person. So let's talk about the coronavirus so there's a faulty comparison that gets thrown around a lot and that's that look how many people die from the flu each year and that is definitely something to keep in perspective and it's something I mentioned in my last video but uh, some people miss the obvious reality here is that this has the potential to be uh, far more negative than that overall if the numbers keep going up exponentially as they have been obviously that 30,000 uh, deaths of influenza could be potentially dwarfed by this now I'm not saying that it is going to be that way and like I said once you learn more about this uh, maybe we could alleviate some of those fears so the coronavirus is a novel virus this this version of the coronavirus this is one particular strain of the co coronavirus uh, this type of virus causes the common cold but this is far more uh, lethal than the common cold now they think that it originated from snakes in a Chinese wet market and if you don't know what a wet market is it's just a place where you go and you buy 
uh, live animals or they're butchered right in front of you. There's a lot of swapping of exotic animals, various DNA, and of course, people, all of which are very densely packed in, by Western standards, less than sanitary conditions. So they've done a gene sequence on the virus and they've determined that the large part of it is coming from snakes. Most of these types of viruses like SARS or MERS are considered zoonotic infections, so they come from animals. Now, why this is so significant is that it is a novel virus, so we don't have any immunity to it as human beings. There is no herd immunity, so that means that the virus uh, can potentially infect a lot of people that it comes into contact with. Now, this is an RNA enveloped virus, and what that means is that it can stay on surfaces for several days. So it's an RNA-based uh, virus, just like Ebola, just like uh, influenza. So it's a serious, potentially serious virus. Now, it is a respiratory infection, which can lead to acute respiratory failure. We're going to talk about some of the actual symptoms and what you can do to detect if you may have this or not. Now, the good news, this is not an airborne virus in the same way that measles is an airborne virus. There's two types of airborne. The, the bad type of airborne is where the virus can just float on dust particles and it can move around over long distances. This requires a droplet infection. So if a person, if you're in the same room or you're in a subway car with people and somebody sneezes, the droplets can fly through the air maybe seven or eight feet, we'll say, and that's how you can get infected. So that means that if you're in the same room with a person and they sneeze and they're maybe seven or eight feet away from you, the droplets could potentially, you know, if they get into your mouth or your eyes, your nose, they could potentially infect you. But that means that if you're in a building with somebody and the air is being circulated, you can't necessarily get it that way. So that's good news. At least it's not airborne in that way yet. Of course, these viruses can potentially mutate in either direction. They can mutate in a positive direction whereby the virus becomes more virulent and more lethal, or it can mutate in the opposite direction also and start uh, replicating itself in people. So it's really hard to, to determine what's going to happen yet. So a few important features here. Now, China claims that the virus is contagious even during the incubation period. This is not uncommon for viruses to be contagious or for disease to be contagious during the incubation period. But apparently the CDC doesn't have uh, the information that they've used to make that claim. So that's not 100% official yet, but that's going to be very serious if that is the case. Because if it is the case that you can transmit the illness before you're even showing symptoms, that means that this thing is potentially worldwide already. And uh, those thermal scanners that they use in airports are going to be potentially useless because people are going to be contagious long before their uh, parexial, which just means feverish. As I previously indicated, the virus can remain dormant on surfaces for up to five days. So that's very important because that means if you're in an airplane seat and somebody was in that seat and had it, that means that they could potentially have left uh, that RNA material there on the seat and you could potentially get it if you're not doing proper hand hygiene. Now, the R-naught value of this virus is somewhere between 2.4 and 3.4. That means everybody who gets it potentially infects 3.4 people. Apparently with SARS, there wasn't a lot of uh, average spreaders of the contagion, but there were a lot of super spreaders. So what a super spreader is, it's somebody who is highly infectious. So you, you'll have one person who has the disorder who maybe only transmits it to one other person. But then you'll have another person who transmits it to 15 or 20 people. Maybe it's just by virtue of, you know, their improper hygiene, or perhaps they just have a more aggressive uh, strain or their behavioral mannerisms. Whatever the case might be, there are these super spreaders out there. The Chinese authorities believe that there are some people who are super spreaders, and you only need a few of those for this to start having exponential uh, effects. And that's pretty much what we're seeing right now on a day-to-day -day basis. But it would appear based on the numbers 
that this is far more contagious because if you go to the World Health Organization website, I was doing some comparisons of the numbers. And if you look at SARS, which most people are comparing this to, and I think it's a faulty comparison, in November, I believe, of 2002, or it might have been 2003, that was when the first case was detected. From the time that the first case was detected to the time that there were an equivalent deaths that we're seeing right now, it took around five months. Whereas in the current case, it's only taken about 45 days. And that can be validated. Anybody can go and see the numbers on the World Health Organization website for SARS. And you can see the day-to-day -day progression of the illness and how many people had it and how high the mortality rate was. Something else that's important to note about the fatality rate of this illness is that when you look at SARS, when there were 2,700 reported cases of SARS, I can't remember the exact date that was. Let me see if I can pull it up here. So April 9th of 2003, there were 2,722 reported cases of SARS and there were 106 deaths. Now, when we were at this number with this particular uh, coronavirus that we're seeing now, we were at around 2,700 and there were around 80 deaths. So remember, ultimately with SARS, the kill rate was around 10%. So when you're looking at these numbers, this is something you need to keep in mind is that if you go to the, to the Wuhan coronavirus interactive map, you're going to see 4,473 total confirmed cases and 107 deaths and 63 people who have recovered. So those are people who have had the disease and who've recovered, obviously. So what that means is that there's still 4,400 people who have this who have yet to recover and they're still struggling with the illness. A lot of those people are in critical condition and as such, unfortunately, the death toll may rise. So there's a bit of a time lag with this that we need to keep in mind is that we don't really know what the true mortality rate of this is going to be until all the smoke clears. It could be much higher than the 3%. Now there was a study out of people out of Wuhan. There was a sample of 41 people and these are the findings of the people who had this disorder. So 98% had the symptoms of a fever. 76% had a cough, 44% had muscle soreness, uh, malaise and fatigue, and 28% of people had phlegm. So obviously the cough and the phlegm are the concerning thing because that's going to allow them to spread the disorder. Uh, not a lot of nasal congestion and sneezing issues. Then of course, if the disease progressed in critical cases, uh, people came down with pneumonia and they developed an acute respiratory system, so the lungs began to shut down. Of this sample of 41 people, 15% eventually did die. So this is why I'm saying that the mortality rates that we're seeing now may not be entirely accurate based on this sample. Now, one of the scarier things with this sample is that there were a lot of people who didn't have previous health conditions and the average age was around 49. So it, it's not just the elderly and the infirm that are falling with this illness. There was actually one young person, I say young in a relative sense, uh, I think they must have been in their late 30s or early 40s, and I don't really have the exact uh, age of this person, but I just know that they're one of the younger people in the sample, of which the average was 49, who had died as a result of the virus. They had no previous medical problems. So that's quite concerning. So that means that you could potentially have younger people who are succumbing to this virus. Now, obviously, that's not the norm. On average, it's going to be people who are over the age of 49. But just something to keep in mind. There is no treatment for this disorder. They would offer you supportive treatment if you went into a hospital. And, of course, there's going to be doctors who disagree what the appropriate treatments should be. So that's going to vary. And in terms of vaccine production, it could take up to a year to get a vaccine for this thing because they have to do all the work for six months and then they got to do some tests. And then, of course, they have to do mass production. So it could be a, quite a while before we see a vaccine. Now, some things that have concerned me from the get go have been the lengths to which China has gone to try to contain this thing. And I really don't think China gets enough credit. There's a lot of 
uh, China bashing, even in the mainstream media, which I think is uh, unprofessional in this instance, because what's potentially saving this from going worldwide right now is the draconian measures that China is employing to try to contain it. I mean, there are obviously there's travel bans in and out of most major cities. China is essentially committing economic suicide right now to ensure that this doesn't spread not only beyond its borders, but within its own country. So I'm not saying that the Chinese government is great, but I just think a lot of the flack, there's this hegemony of anti-Chinese sentiment that I believe is perhaps a little uh, overused and People need to really look at the situation for what it is because you couldn't pull a lot of this stuff that they're doing off anywhere else in the world. So I've seen some images of what looked like something out of Mad Max. I mean, they're barricading roads. The government is blocking roads with mounds of dirt or they're deactivating roads or digging trenches in roads so people can't leave certain cities or can't enter certain towns. Pictures of people with weapons, you know, protecting various entries to certain communities. So whether this is fear-driven and people in their communities are being overly aggressive about enforcing their own borders, who knows? But it, it's definitely on lockdown. It's martial law there in a lot of places. Transport is restricted in and out of major cities like Beijing, where I think one of the first death deaths has been reported. So this is going to have drastic economic implications for the world eventually, especially now that China has extended the Chinese New Year, meaning that the industrial machine that essentially drives the planet has now been suspended for another three days. Another problem that China is going to face in the coming days is that a lot of people there are going to be running out of food and they're going to have to go out to the grocery stores and interact with people. So as much as the town is on lockdown, you can only enforce that for so long, even with a population as compliant as the Chinese because of the whole social credit system, which I'm sh I'm guessing that if you don't go to work, uh, and by work I mean if you don't uh, put your life at risk in one of these hospitals, then you potentially lose social credit. So that's one of the you know draconian synoptical measures that the Chinese government uh, perhaps is implementing, and that wouldn't fly here. But all the more reason to have lots of food and water on hand so you don't have to put yourself in those precarious situations because eventually that is going to be a problem if this continues. And I'm not sure what they're going to do after, you know, the three days elapses and this thing is still spreading, uh, the, the three days grace that they gave their workers to uh, extend the Chinese New Year because if they all take it back to work and they have to work in these conditions, then that could uh, potentially see the evolution of this into a much, much larger problem. Some people think this could potentially cause an economic downturn if the situation isn't reconciled there. Now, there is reports from a Hong Kong professor, and this is mainstream media, indicates that uh, the, there's a potential that this is 30 times greater than they're saying it is. That means that 30 times the amount of people potentially have this than China is reporting. And if that's the case, that means that this could only be the beginning of this. Now, it's hard to say right now whether or not this virus will burn itself out, whether or not they can quarantine it, or whether or not that's a valid prognosis of the situation. There was also a video of a nurse who alleged to be from Wuhan who claimed that the infections, that the Chinese government was hiding it, that it was actually up to 90,000 people who were infected. There were other vloggers who indicated that they stopped doing tests in the hospitals or that they ran out of tests. And for that reason, the numbers were much higher also. I think everybody suspects the numbers like everybody suspects foul play in the Epstein case. It's it's pretty much pervasive across the board, no matter who you ask. Most people think that the numbers are not necessarily reflective of what is going on there. So it's likely that we will see a dramatic rise in cases. Now, one other thing to consider is that there's a lot of people who don't like the Chinese government. And one of the first things I do when looking at some of this information coming out of China is, you know, consider the source. You know, it may be that people are trying to, as, as bad as the Chinese government is, 
Uh, it may be that a lot of these people are, are just trying to make them look worse than they are. So that's something that you need to keep in mind when you are searching YouTube by upload date and by recency. That's the best way to get the most up-to-date information. If you're doing a YouTube search on coronavirus, go by upload date and then click uh, last hour in the drop-down search options. That's how you're going to get the most up-to-date info. So as much as I think they are downplaying the numbers, there's no certainty that what some of these people are saying is, is true necessarily. So let's just keep that in mind. Another thing that you should know is going on, there's definitely appears to be a bit of an information war within China. There are ongoing Hong Kong protests. They're still protesting and now they're of course wearing N95 masks, although that's pretty customary in China. But there was a recent firebombing of a place that the Chinese government wanted to use for quarantine. Now China is building more hospitals, as you know, but they are also commandeering certain buildings to quarantine people. And apparently the Hong Kong protesters aren't too happy about that. So there's certainly risk of disinformation on both sides. Even the Washington Times had published an article where they're interviewing an Israeli bioweapons expert or retired Israeli bioweapons expert who indicated that this potentially was leaked from a Wuhan uh, bioweapons research facility. So I'll post a link to that and you can uh, pass judgment on that. One of the problems here is though, is that there are flights still being permitted in and out of China to other communities. Uh, the World Health Organization hasn't declared this a international emergency yet. So until they do that, we can expect to see uh, movement in and out of Ch China continue. So far, with the exception of a couple countries, we haven't seen sustained transmission, human-to-human -human transmission. So that is a good thing. And there are no clusters of the virus outside of the epicenter just yet. Uh, there are some clusters developing in China, but not outside of China. So that's positive news. Because once that starts to happen, you know that there's sustained human to human transmission. So my threshold for going into DEF CON mode with this, I would have to start seeing a sustained transmission from human to human outside of China. It would have to be 100% confirmed by an independent agency outside of China that this in fact is contagious during the incubation period. Because if that's the case, then definitely all bets are off. Um, and we also need to start seeing a higher mortality rate as a result of this. But that is something which, again, you know, this thing could mutate in a variety of different ways uh, for better or for worse. And that could lead to increased uh, mortality rates. So we really have to see, we really have to give this another month to see what the true uh, mortality rates are. Now, it's arguable that in the case of any disease like this, there's a lot of cases that just don't get reported. Because there's a lot of people who maybe are asymptomatic carriers or it doesn't affect them enough that they need to go to the hospital per se. But that's something that's going to be the case with all illnesses throughout history. There was probably millions of people who had the Spanish flu who were never recorded, which is why there's such a wide range of estimates between 50 million to 100 million. Some people go as low as 20 million. So it's really hard to say the exact numbers. But uh, these are still potentially useful statistics. Another thing that would tip the scales for me, if we started to see sustained transmission in a country like India, where there's very poor living conditions, densely populated, uh, unsanitary living conditions, then I would definitely be worried as well. But right now, I think I'm not too worried about this getting out of control yet we're gonna have to see i think there there's definitely potential there for it to happen but bear in mind that sars had very similar characteristics and it did burn itself out within the span of six months with uh, some good containment measures but on the flip side of that so it would appear that this is spreading far more aggressively than sars was in spite of these unprecedented containment measures that they're taking. So again, I would encourage you to go and do your own research because for every person out there saying that this is the next great pandemic, you're going to find two or three who say it's nothing to worry about. 
So you're going to have to make up your own mind. And as the results come out and as this unfolds, I guess it's going to be easier and easier to get an accurate picture of what is going on here. But check out those links I posted in the description and check out my recent video on general pandemic preparedness and what you can do to get prepared. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. If you enjoyed the video, Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com. Your one-stop shop for premium, high-quality, brand-name products that have been tried and tested by myself and other YouTube gear reviewers. My subscribers save 10% off by using the coupon code SURVIVALPREPPER. All one word in all caps.